Good morning, ladies and gents, and welcome to the A.M. Higley Safety Orientation. You're mine for the next 23 minutes, and what we're going to cover is A.M. Higley. We're going to go over the policies. We're going to go over a couple general items, some high-risk activities. We're going to touch on PPE because that's the most challenging item that we have on our job sites. Then we're going to close her out. Then you're going to take the biggest, fattest, most difficult quiz of your entire life, so you better be paying attention. Starting it off, this is really all about you, this orientation. This slide specifically is about choice. You have the choice to work safely or not. Just like you have the choice to pull your cell phone out and text and drive on the road, even though we know that you're more likely to be in an accident if you text and drive. So it goes along with all of your work tasks that you have for the day. Think about it. You have the choice to, to wear the guards. You have the choice to lock out the casters when you work on the scaffold, to not stand on top of the ladder. That's your choice. And, and honestly, there's, there's probably somebody that, that requires you to come home at the end of the day. Um, and, and that's your choice if you want to put more at risk or not. But you are the first line of defense against injuries. Um, not me, not the president of our company, but you. I know that it can be in uncomfortable to uh, confront somebody else about working unsafe, but honestly, their families would want you to say something. They wouldn't be very appreciative if they knew that you had the opportunity to prevent their loved ones from getting into an injury, but you decided not to say something. So uh, at the end of the day, we all have the same goal. Um, just we want to go to work the next day we want to make a buck and we want to go home at the end of the day it's that simple so um, we're just asking if you see something to say something let's go over a few general items before we dive into the specifics incidents injuries need to be reported to Higley immediately if an incident happened yesterday and wasn't reported until today workers compensation might not cover your injury it's that simple. Even if it's a little bump, say something. Don't smoke on the site unless the superintendent gives you a specific location. Don't chew. Owners don't like to find spitters, and neither do we. And please be mindful of your language. Be professional. Um, and no weapons, specifically guns, even if you have a permit to carry. So last... No drinking or using drugs on site. I've heard all the stories about substance consumption back in the day and on lunch break, but that day's in the past. We have unfortunately caught several people under the influence on our projects and do follow the disciplinary protocol, so don't be handing out your prescription meds to anyone else. And if you do find uh, or see OSHA or EPA on site, don't give them a tour of the facility. Send them our way, and since you're already doing your work as safe as possible, you have nothing to worry about. Category 1 violations are violations that have imminent danger or at high risk for injuries. Fall protection, like standing on top of ladders, confined space, lockout tagout, trenching and excavating, or pretty much anything that these guys are doing in the construction of Mount Rushmore. Any activities that could cause serious harm or death are Category 1 violations. The first violation results in suspension for the rest of the workday and the following workday. Listen up, foreman. You get written a Category 2 violation if anyone on your crew is violating a Category 1 violation. The second offense means you will be suspended indefinitely. Category 2 issues are minor violations hard hat, safety glasses, so on and so forth. And that's a three strikes and you're out policy. Foreman, if you have two or more of your employees that aren't following the rules, such as a group of people not wearing safety glasses, you will receive a write-up as well. Please follow up with your guys so we don't have to go down that road. PPE is the biggest deficiency that we find on our job sites. And just so you know, your employer has agreed that you, the employee, 
will um, abide by all of these requirements 100%. So if you have an issue with it, you need to take it to your employer. 100% hard hat and safety glasses. That's to be worn. Most of you should know that. The biggest problem that we have is people wearing prescription eyewear. If you have prescription glasses on, they must say Z87.1 on them with side shields or they are not safety rated. So if your optometrist says that they are safety rated, they must have Z87.1 or they are not. It's a no-brainer on our jobs that face shields must be worn when cutting, drilling, grinding, etc. because particles become projectiles. We also say that you should wear high visibility vests when working around vehicles. And the last thing is to meet OSHA code, here's a rule of thumb for hearing protection. You need to wear hearing protection if you have to raise your voice to have a conversation. Um, so in summary, protect your eyes, protect your ears, protect your smile, and wear the PPE. Each year, there are about 350 fall fatalities that occur in construction each year. They're the number one reason for fatalities. But what you don't hear is how many disabling injuries we have. And there are about 100,000 disabling injuries. To me, that's scarier than the fatalities. That means you're not returning to work. That means you're going to have extreme difficulty with normal tasks. Maybe you like to golf. Maybe you like to mow the grass. Grill burgers on Sunday. You're going to have challenges. These incidents are preventable. And we hear about them occurring in Cleveland each and every year. You probably know something that's fallen from varying heights. If you'll be working above six foot on, say, a rooftop, mezzanine, whatever, you need to have a documented plan. We call it a JHA. We also require a pre-work meeting that has to take place with Higley's Safety Department. One thing you need to know, please hear this, there's no safe distance to an unprotected edge where you could fall six foot or more. It doesn't matter if you are 100 foot, if you're 20 foot, it does not matter. Distance is not a sufficient means of protection. We need to be tied off, guardrail, or in the random chance that you're using a safety net, that is compliant as well. If it is downright impossible or more dangerous to follow the fall protection rules 100% of the time, let us know. We may be able to create an alternate fall protection plan or assist you with creating a plan that does meet OSHA and Higley codes. Don't just get the work done. Last, think about what you're tying off with, or two. OSHA does not allow you to have the option to free fall more than six feet, which means you need to be mindful of where your anchor point is and tie off overhead if possible. Okay, we're cruising right along here. If you just look at the picture on the right there, um, this is the breakdown for why we require um, retractable lifelines to be worn whenever you're need to be tied off and the distance to the ground is less than 18 and a half feet. Um, we also require retractables to be worn in aerial lifts, which is boom and scissor as well. So um, if you're working on a rooftop and your means of fall protection is a warning line, well, we got, we, we got to look at this two ways. If you are a roofer, meaning you are literally putting down the roofing membrane or the insulation, well then the warning line has to be six foot from the edge. And you have to be tied off if you're on the other side of the warning line. If you're doing non-roofing activities, which is everything else, then the warning line has to be 15 foot from the edge. And you have to be tied off if you're under, under the warning line. If you're erecting and dismantling a scaffold, you must be tied off unless it is infeasible or creates a greater hazard. What this means is you can't just go up there and say, ah, I don't want to be tied off today, or ah, it might be difficult. We need to have this conversation with Higley leadership, and it needs to be documented. We just talked about how falls are the number one reason for fatalities in our industry. Ladders are the number one reason for falls, and it shouldn't be to anybody's surprise because everybody uses ladders. Don't stand on the top two rungs or use an A-frame ladder collapsed. Ensure all fall protection plans are written down in a JHA and specifics are documented in a daily huddle. 
Okay, let's chat about confined space for a hot minute here. So as we mentioned with some of the other high-risk activities like fall protection and trenching and excavating and some of the other things, pre-work meeting must be conducted for confined space work. Um, there are new construction safety standards in regards to confined space that we can help you digest. That's our job. We'd be more than happy to help you understand it. So a confined space has a few requirements. Number one, it's large enough for somebody to bodily enter. Number two, it has limited or restricted means for entry or exit. This means that maybe we have to get in through a ladder or we have to crawl to get in and out. And number three, it's not designed for continuous employee occupancy, meaning it's not designed with lighting or ventilation. To summarize a permit required confined space, it's pretty much a confined space with a serious hazard. If a serious hazard were to occur in a confined space with limited egress, ventilation, or whatever, um, it can be a, a real hazard to get out of that space. A few examples of, the confined, of confined spaces could include elevator shafts, vaults, tanks, sewer manholes or storm drains, HVAC ducts, attics and basements depending on the layout, and crawl spaces. That's just a few of them. There's many more. So just to reiterate, no work is to take place in a confined space until we have a pre-work meeting and the space has been evaluated by a competent person. If you think it could be a confined space, just ask. Silica is a common mineral that we find in many of our building materials our brick, our block, our glass, tile, stone, whenever we mix mortar, um, concrete. So whenever we do abrasive work to any of that, it then becomes airborne. And breathing it in can cause silicosis. These small particles, once they're breathed in, become lodged deep in the walls of your lungs. When your body tries to attack these particles, they can't break them down because they're crystals. The small parts of your lungs then turn into scar tissue. This is known as fibrosis. This makes it extremely difficult to breathe, almost like somebody is standing on your chest. Silicosis often doesn't occur until 15 or 20 years after the exposure throughout your career. Other medical issues can also occur from breathing in silica dust as well, not just silicosis. And it's also known as a carcinogen, which means it causes cancer. The new permissible exposure limit is 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air. It sounds like that's a different language, but what this is equivalent to is six grains of sand pulverized and put into a one cubic foot space around your breathing zone for an entire day. Six grains of pulverized sand. That's it. So the question is this. How can we make sure that we're under the new permissible exposure limit? And the answer is this. Ensure all silica dust generating tasks that you are completing are covered under Table 1 or your company has an exposure assessment, which is just an air sample. The exposure assessment must represent the work that you are being, that you are completing. So if you have an exposure assessment for jackhammering and you're only going to be doing mortar mixing on site, they don't add up. They're not the same. So what is table one, you ask? I'd be happy to tell you. All right, so we're going to talk about table one. And while this example, if you look just below the arrow there, is for handheld grinders for mortar removal, which is tuck pointing, there are many different tasks that are covered by table one. So there's demo with large equipment. There is... Um, jackhammering and many other tasks or tools that are discussed. This one we're just going to talk about handheld grinders for mortar removal. So if you follow across where I have that red arrow, um, as we just said that is the equipment or the task. The second column is the engineering and work practice control methods and then last is the required respiratory protection um, that you need. So um, if we follow the handheld grinders and then we talk about the engineering controls and we use grinder equipped with commercially available shroud and dust collective system 
We operate and maintain the tool in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. And then we talk a little bit more about the dust collection down there at the bottom. If we slide over again, um, respiratory protection is broken out into two columns, less than four hours and more than four hours. So if we take a summary of this, we say that we're going to do tuck pointing, we're going to follow all of the engineering and work practice controls, and our task is maybe three hours. Well, then you'll see right there that it says APF of 10, and that is the required respiratory protection for less than four hours as long as we follow the engineering controls. And if we do all of that, OSHA says we are under the permissible exposure limit. What is APF? Well, APF means assigned protection factor. And all that really means is how much protection your respirator is giving you. So in our last example, if we did the task of tuck pointing for less than four hours, we need an APF of 10. And here's two examples right here. And if we do it for more than um, four hours, then we needed an APF of 25. So there's two more examples on the right side there. So um, to wear a respirator, we need to have a medical evaluation and a fit test, and these need to be done annually to make sure that we are um, good to wear a respirator. And the last thing that I want to mention in the first bullet point is that there's no dry sweeping for housekeeping of silica dust. I know, shocker, crazy, end of the world. But realistically, that is where some of the most, some of the highest exposure um, concentrations come from is whenever we dry sweep silica dust. It now becomes airborne again, and everybody around is now engulfed in it. So OSHA has said that either wet sweeping or high efficiency particulate air filtered vacuums are required for housekeeping, HEPA vacuums or wet sweeping. We have talked to many people, many earthwork uh, contractors that have had trenches collapse on them or somebody that they know. It's happened to many people. And we've actually met a trench that collapsed on a gentleman in, in upstate New York and he died and they had to bring him back to life. So for this reason, all trenching and excavating work is required to have a pre-work meeting like the other high-risk activities. One cubic yard of soil can weigh up to 3,000 pounds, which is the weight of, of a car. So before anybody enters a trench, soil must be classified by one visual and one mechanical means during the pre-entry inspection. It's got to happen before anybody gets in the trench, and it's going to happen after rainstorms. And last, protection is required when five feet or deeper. It does not matter if it's only five foot one, and in some instances, unstable soil should be um, should have protection when you are under five uh, under five foot. But that is per the competent person's decisions. In the past few years, we've had many close calls with people hitting buried gas lines or buried electrical lines or even fiber optic lines. Um, and so because of this, we have an excavation permit that needs to be filled out per area, not daily, but per area with our superintendent. A competent person for your company will fill it out with the Higley superintendent. Um, in, this, in this permit, the contractor needs to detail how they will continuously monitor the depth of the utility. Don't assume that the depth of the utility is the same depth throughout the entire route of the excavation. Too many incidents happen whenever we have this false idea. No digging with machinery within three foot of utility um, unless you're using an electronic sensor is used. Then you can get as close to 18 inches. Lockout tagout means the removal of all electrical and other physical hazards uh, prior to working in the vicinity. So this is obviously in reference to electricity, but we're also talking about many other things, um, such as working underneath of an elevator to make sure that we can lock out the power for an elevator so that it can't come crashing down on somebody when they're working underneath of it. Electricity has been known to arc from the electrical lines into other metal equipment. 
So for this reason, if you're working in um, equipment like an excavator around power lines, we need to stay at least 20 feet away from the power lines. If you have to get closer, well then we need to have a pre-work meeting where we can discuss what our other options are. These are not all of the Higley above and beyond OSHA requirements. Simply, these are the ones that we see most often. Higley has a fall protection rule that is six foot for everything. It doesn't matter if you're working on a scaffold, if you're doing steel erection, or if you're on a rooftop. If there is an exposure that you can fall six feet or more, you must be tied off. You must have a game plan. If fall exposure is less than 18 and a half feet, you need to use a retractable. Um, if you're ever working in a lift, boom, scissor, whatever, you need to have a retractable. No use of safety monitor or control decking zones unless approved by AM Higley. This means, again, that you have to have a positive means of fall protection. 100% hard hat and safety glasses. This is to include what we talked about earlier, prescription glasses. And lastly, each company is required to have an on-site safety coordinator that has OSHA 30 within the past five years and the first aid CPR within the past two years. Only a few more slides. Coming down the home stretch here, the last topic we have is paperwork. So the pre-work paperwork requirements. First of all, each company has a site-specific safety plan. That is a 3SP. If you are the foreman of your company, you need to review this 3SP and you need to sign off on it so that you've seen it, you understand it, and you're agreeing to the rules that your company said you would do. Pre-work meetings are also required for all imminent danger tasks, as we've mentioned several times. We're talking fall protection, trenching, excavating, lockout, tagout, confined space, anything of that nature. And the JHA, Job Hazard Analysis, needs to be updated for any imminent danger tasks. Weekly paperwork, toolbox trainings, and safety inspections. You're doing a safety inspection of the workplace. You need to be looking out for any deficient items and you need to be notifying Higley. If you do not have toolbox trainings, just work with Higley. We have our own, you can join in with ours. And lastly, the daily paperwork. Daily huddles for all activities. Everybody's doing a daily huddle, doesn't matter if you're, if you're uh, painting or if you're working on a scaffold, daily paperwork is required, daily huddles. And pre-use inspections of all aerial lifts, forklifts, skid steers, cranes, scaffolding, etc. Closing, in closing, anybody that we've ever talked to that has been in an incident said the exact same thing. Go ahead, ask anybody. I didn't think it could happen to me. And the sad truth is, is that we all get complacent, we all cut corners, and then it happens. The incident happens. And so what we're just asking is, is don't look the other way if you see something goofy. If something doesn't look right, don't look the other way. Um, you're not helping anybody out. And please don't cut corners for yourself because guess what? Somebody relies on you to make it home. So don't get caught up in the same trap. Um, so with that, that's my motivational speech. And if you have any questions, please discuss it with the Higley leadership. Um, and I'll shut up here so you can go over the site-specific items with the superintendent based on the site that you're working on.